The speakers today have, have a real depth of expertise on Ukraine, on, on, on Russia, on Russian-Ukrainian relations, on uh, the European political scene, which is incredibly important. And so I'm really, really happy. I'm going to say a, a few brief words of introduction uh, before I turn things over. I also want to mention that in the back, um, if you're interested in coming, uh, next week we have Mark Ian Dobjonsky talking about, uh, about Russian-Ukrainian relations for the Pali lecture. Uh, so we're going to continue our, our, our uh, examination of, of you know, some of the, the issues at play here. And so I encourage you to come to that. Uh, there's a crease table in the back if you want to sign up uh, for our email list. Uh, today's panel is going to be, we're going to aim for about 45 minutes of presentations, uh, brief remarks really, and then open it up for questions. Uh, we'll take questions from the audience. We also want to be sensitive that uh, right now um, in um, Russia and in Belarus particularly, people are being arrested for speaking out against the war. So if people want to uh, post questions anonymously. Um, you can go up to a table right there, write your question on the, on the pad, and uh, Emily uh, will pass the question on. Uh, I'll briefly introduce the presenters, and then we'll go. Um, I ask everyone to try, to try to limit your remarks to about uh, five to seven minutes, if you can, because I really want to have a general discussion and, uh, and time for Q&A. Uh, presenting first will be Professor Alexandra Wallow from the Department of Slavic and Eurasian Languages and Literatures. Uh, next will be Vit Professor Vitaly Chernetsky from Slavic Languages, uh, Slavic and Eurasian Languages and Literatures. Um, I will be uh, in the middle of the panel uh, from the Department of History. Uh, next, or I'm sorry, before me will be Professor Robert Roeschneider, who is the uh, Robert uh, Worcester Distinguished Professor uh, of Political Science, uh, then me. Then Professor Valeria Zutsati, uh, a visiting assistant professor of political science. And fi finally, Professor uh, Annie Kokobobo, chair of uh, Slavic and Eurasian. So uh, we will each present, uh, each give our perspective from a, a variety of different, different points of view, uh, from Ukrainian studies, from history, from political science. Uh, and then we'll have a general discussion. So we look forward to, to hearing your thoughts and to, to seeing uh, how we can, we can think about a response uh, to this, this invasion of Ukraine by Russia. So without further ado, I'll turn things over to Alexandra. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Okay, thank you. Um, so this is uh, an incredibly difficult time for me and all Ukrainians. I am Ukrainian. Um, I was born and raised there. Um, uh, I'm from Western Ukraine, Lviv, um, and my remarks are going to be quite personal because I, through all of these events, uh, they're ongoing and developing very quickly. I do not have any kind of distance from them, so, and I think it's important, even in these kinds of panel discussions that are focused on big questions and intellectual arguments, to uh, keep in mind that this is all happening live, uh, and we're all watching it, uh, and these are not films. These are actual people dying, um, being injured, losing their homes. Um, so I will, I will begin with that. Uh, as you know, this invasion began a week ago, so today is day seven. Ukrainians are actually counting the days, day one, day two, day three. It is being broadcast on Ukrainian television 24-7. Uh, all major Ukrainian television stations have uh, come together to organize this broadcast. Um, some of them have to broadcast from bomb shelters uh, in these circumstances. The invasion was completely unprovoked, completely senseless, doesn't make any sense to any rational person, and it's grounded, from what I understand, in Vladimir Putin's own false view of history, his desire to correct history, to take us back somehow in time to reconstitute the Soviet Union. It is also motivated by his hatred for the values of freedom, democracy, and human rights on which the free world is built. Um, these are the values which Ukraine has been struggling for for a long time. Um, Ukraine is a democratic society. 
um, it has been successful in establishing democracy in the last, in the past decade or so. And this is his assault on these values. So this is not just assault on Ukraine, this is assault on the West. Uh, as of this morning, over 2,000 civilians have been killed, um, including dozens of children. Over 660,000 people have fled from various parts of Ukraine, either to Western Ukraine, or they're crossing the border with Poland, other neighboring countries, and fleeing abroad. My native city of Lviv has now become a hub for internally displaced people. And all of my family, as I speak, are involved in providing for these people, finding shelter, and also supporting the armed forces of Ukraine through various means. I talked to my mom a few days back, and she, she was feeling awful about not being able to do anything about this, but then she found a task. Um, she is um, working together with her uh, neighbors to make these camouflage nets for the army because they're lacking um, this kind of supply. So the secondhand stores in Ukraine are donating secondhand clothing. She's cutting it up into strips. And um, these big bags of strips are carried to other uh, places, including bomb shelters, where women and men and children are weaving them into these huge camouflage nets. This is not ordinary life. And this is to say nothing of the fact that uh, Ukrainian cities uh, more to the east are being bombed with prohibited bombs, with cluster bombs, with vacuum bombs, um, that it, which is a war crime. Um, it's a violation of international law. Uh, Putin has not been successful in um, waging a very quick war on Ukraine. He did not realize what he got himself into, certainly. And because his initial war efforts failed, he is now waging a war against civilians. He is using massive missile strikes, and these are raining down bombs on the historical parts of Kharkiv, the second largest city of Ukraine, Kyiv, the capital of Ukraine, uh, and civilians are dying, and buildings are being destroyed. As of this morning, um, the National Kharkiv University, the Karamzin University, a very famous institution, has been bombed and caught fire. These are just horrendous things. Um, and as you know, they have had um, a lot of resonance abroad. A lot of people have come out in outrage. They're protesting. The West has banded together like never before to um, enact sanctions on Russia. But at the same time, Ukraine is still fighting this war alone. Um, yes, with military aid from the West. Yes, with a lot of support, moral support, financial support from the West. But the actual task of stopping this is up to Ukrainians and to Ukraine. There's been a lot of heroic action in Ukraine. I don't think Ukrainians themselves have realized that that they are this prepared to die for their freedom. Uh, but now it's, it's hitting home, uh, I think, everyone. I talked to my father recently. He's an academic. He's a um, professor of electrical engineering. He spent his entire life um, working on electric drives for wind turbines and solar panels. He's published numerous, numerous papers. He's never held a gun in his life. But you know what he told me just the other day? That if necessary, he's going to take up a gun. And he said, it's better to die with honor than to live in bondage. And it's, it's incredibly hard to listen to such things and to realize that for some people, these are not just words. This is their life. And many of them have lost their lives already. So. I think I agree with Ukrainian President Zelensky, who in his interview to the Western press yesterday said that even though the West is trying to stay out of the war, 
and uh, probably that's wise, but the entire world is already involved in this war, um, which is an unprecedented war in Europe, and we haven't seen anything like this since World War II. This is a really, really just awful, horrific event. Um, so I concur with him that everyone is already involved. Um, everyone is part of this war, whether they like it or not, even if they don't realize it. And I think it's, it's going to transform the world one way or another. Um, there will be many, many things that change after this. With his actions, Putin destroyed international peace that held in World War II, after World War II in Europe for quite some time, but now it's over. And I really don't know how we emerge from this. And I hope that my colleagues in other disciplines who are here on this panel can maybe speculate on some of the ways in which th they can resolve the situation. Uh, I will probably stop here and uh, pass on the floor to my colleague Vitali. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alessandra. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It is, for me, just like to, for Alexandra, it's a very challenging task to talk right now, as it is for any person from Ukraine. I, too, was born in Ukraine, grew up there, finished high school, came to the US at uh, a fairly young age, at 19, as an exchange student. I am from the city of Odessa, which is the big port city on the Black Sea in the south. And uh, all my family, all my close relatives are still back in Ukraine. Some are in Odessa, some up until very recently were in Kyiv. I have relatives also in the east, in the Donbass region. My Kyiv uh, relatives, after spending nights in shelters, did manage to escape from the city under siege and Russian bombardment and are now internally displaced persons uh, close to the border with Hungary. My Odessa relatives are all still in the city dealing with the insanity of this brutal and unprovoked aggression. Uh, people's lives have been totally appended overnight and uh, have, people have aged many years in one day. But we also indeed see unprecedented heroism and resolve and also a consolidation of identity. One of the big lies that was perpetuated by uh, the Russian government, the Russian leadership under President Putin, is that Ukraine is a divided country. That somehow people of different ethnic backgrounds or people with preference for different languages as the first language to speak uh, cannot live together, that one group oppresses the other. Nothing could be further from the case. Ukraine is a diverse country, just like the United States is a diverse country. The diversity is its strength. Uh, Ukraine, especially since the first Russian invasion in the spring of 2014, its identity has really emerged stronger and more consolidated. It truly is a civic nation in the most profound sense of the term, where the people are united by the ideals of freedom, dignity, and democracy. The revolution of winter 13-14 has been called in Ukraine the revolution of dignity. And this is very important and very meaningful. The population in Russia, and unfortunately many sympathizers, misguided sympathizers in the West, believe the Russian government's propaganda talking points. Even early statements of condemnation of the Russian invasion by some organizations 
found it necessary to put some fault on Ukraine, Ukrainian government and in an absolutely unconscionable way. We have to realize that there's no guilt of anyone in Ukraine that in any way excuses this invasion. And please, if you hear anyone blaming the victim, the victim should not be blamed. If folks need more information, thank you for being here to receive more information. Do more efforts to educate yourselves, educate your neighbors and loved ones. Try to find out more. This is also very important to hear and try to understand Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian history, Ukrainian traditions from the Ukrainian perspective. For too long in the West, the legacy of Cold War, the study was Russo-centric, Kremlin-centric. Uh, unconsciously or consciously, uh, Russian imperialist biases were reproduced and reinforced through several generations of academic research here in the US and in other countries around the world. There were, of course, many scholars who worked to challenge that, to protest that, to introduce element of diversity. But it has been an uphill battle. We now are at a moment of reckoning for all of us, including here in the US academic community. We need to completely rethink how we approach the study of that part of the world, of the former Soviet Union and the former Soviet bloc, and completely transform how we deal with that and what sort of lessons we draw from its history and legacy. Thank you very much. I'll be glad to answer more in the discussion. Thank you, Vitaly. And next we have Professor Robert Rorschneider. Okay, Emily. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm a political scientist, and I was born overseas as well, but not in the Ukraine, but on the good side of the Iron Curtain, if you uh, want to namely in West Germany, where I spent the first two decades of my life. And when uh, this very important panel was assemb assembled, my immediate question was, well, what can I contribute to a viewpoint or to setting the agenda about the items we ought to think about uh, that is uh, somehow accounting for the European uh, perspective? I always find it useful to look at a map to first orient myself and see uh, what a conflict means for the country that is not immediately involved, just like... Uh, uh, my fellow panelists uh, here are, and uh, we see immediately why the conflict is such a threat for uh, Europe, the European Union, but also some of the countries which are part of Europe and not part of the EU. The Ukraine has uh, shares uh, many miles of borders with uh, important EU countries like Poland, Slovakia, Romania. Uh, we see that the Baltic states are further up north, and we see that Finland, also part of the EU but not part of NATO, also shares a very long border with uh, Russia. So there is almost an immediacy here why the EU and Europe should be concerned about the conflict in the Ukraine. In fact, my first question really was, where was Europe all, the, all these years? It's not new that there's a conflict in the Ukraine. It's not new that there's a conflict in post-Russian republics. Uh, the latest uh, fatalities I'm aware of before the war started is that over 14,000 Ukrainian citizens have been killed during the various military conflicts with Russia. And the European Union is only now waking up to the fact that Russia is not the peaceful power that it for a long time believed it was. So why, why is that? What happened? I don't have a firm answer for you, but I think it's worth thinking about it. And uh, I think there are a couple of items we need to keep in mind as we try to understand European Union politics towards uh, the Ukraine, Russia, and other post-Soviet republics. The first one is that Europe was really preoccupied with itself for the past 10 years. 
There was the economic crisis, there was the migration crisis in 2015, you all have heard about Brexit. There, there was very much an inward perspective adopted by um, most states uh, people in, in Europe, perhaps exemplified by Ch former Chancellor Angela Merkel, who is, uh, has long shaped the uh, policies of Germany and the European Union, and who has firmly believed that she, her special relationship with Putin would avert the worst disaster. No, it didn't work. Everybody recognizes it, and the German government just did a U-turn, a 180-degree U-turn towards Russian policies. The other general talking point that I'd like to raise is, and, and I have to be very careful here, and that's why there is, there's the question mark, is uh, there was perhaps a failure by the West to recognize the security policy of security needs of post-Soviet Russia. And I'm not justifying any military action on account of that. But I remember the debates in 1990, 1991, when Germ West Germany then West German Chancellor Kohl tried to unify Germany after the Iron Curtain came down. And one of the biggest issues and potential stumbling blocks then was the concern by the so then Soviet Union that NATO would expand into East Germany. Now, East Germany is way to the west of where NATO troops are now, which are now part of NATO, as you can see on this map. So perhaps, I think, if there is a question to be asked whether the West... Western Europe and Europe was not attuned enough to the security needs of Russia is the question of where are the natural boundaries of NATO in, this, in Europe. But what can Europe do now? Well, I would distinguish, when I talk about Europe, I would distinguish between two players. I would think about, we talk about the European Union as an organization and uh, I'm a bit of a skeptic how much the EU as an organization can do, in part because it doesn't have the resources, it doesn't have a standing army, it has a common uh, foreign and security policy which has to be decided unanimously among the 24, 27 member states. That's very, very difficult to, for, for the EU to act on any foreign policy sentiment that re represents the entire bloc. What about EU membership for the Ukraine now, something that has been floated or has been actually explicitly advocated for by the Ukrainian uh, President Zelensky yesterday in, a, in, in what must have been a very emotional and effective appeal to the European Parliament. I hear already hear pushback in large part because EU negotiations uh, membership and accession negotiations are extremely complicated. There are lots of countries in the line who would be upset if uh, the EU were to say right now, yes, the Ukraine is a formal member. Leaving is very much aside the basic question, would it help? And I have not read anything anywhere which suggests immediate membership would help the Ukraine in any decisive way to deal with the invading armies. What about individual countries? They will bear the brunt of whatever needs to be done. It's already starting with hundreds of thousands of refugees arriving in Poland, uh, tens of thousands in Slovakia and Romania. They will have to deal with it. Equipment and resources of, militaries, of any military sort will have to be provided by individual member countries, in large part because there is no standing army of the European Union. And in the long run, individual member countries will have to cough up the resources that President Obama, President Trump, and other presidents already have complained about, namely that the EU member countries or NATO member countries are not doing their fair share to contribute to the NATO mission what they said they would bring to the table. So there are lots of complicated issues, in addition to the enormous human suffering that we have so eloquently heard about from the previous speakers. And I don't have a solution, but these are some of the issues that I see are on the agenda for European countries. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Robert. Um, just want to make sure this is, this is on. Okay. Um, I, I want to begin by saying uh, how, how moved I am by, by the remarks of our, of our Ukrainian colleagues and, and also just how impressed I am with their fortitude for, for presenting this morning and, and today and in all this, you know, I'm sure being on the phone and texting back and forth with family and friends uh, on the front lines in Ukraine uh, facing this invasion. So I really want to, want to thank both of you so much for, for your really powerful uh, words uh, and, and, um, and we're, our thoughts are with you. Um, I'm also a historian and you know, historians are, are famously loath to, to predict the future or comment on events until you know, 30 years have, have passed. Uh, but since you know, President Vladimir Putin has decided to, to be a historian, um, and, and misuse, uh, I would say, Russian, Ukrainian, and Soviet history to justify his invasion, I, I'm going to try to weigh in here uh, on, on using my sort of methodology as a historian to think about, um, to just sort of th set forth a few ideas of how I'm thinking about this conflict. And, and I'm going to mention five, five takeaways. Uh, first, Historians like to debate continuity versus discontinuity, and, and I think a lot of people were taken by surprise by Putin's invasion. And I will say I was taken by surprise by its extent, by the, the extent of, of the invasion, you know, the, the, the fighting uh, and targeting um, the entire country uh, rather than, than, than uh, its eastern part. Uh, but I think, you know, historians might very well now judge Putin's in, uh, presidency as, as one as the history of, of war, of opportunistic wars, uh, and, and, and I would say rather cynical, cynical, uh, cynical uh, efforts um, to, to, uh, to insert Russian power into, into places and, and to use extremely brutal methods uh, to do so. So Chechnya in 1999, which, which is really coincides with Putin's rise a, as a president, um, the invasion of Russia into Georgia in 2008, uh, which, which I experienced as a, as a Fulbright scholar uh, in, in that country. Uh, the the uh, war that uh, Russia has been uh, fighting uh, through uh, by, by arming and supporting separatists in Ukraine since 2014. Uh, coming in uh, into Syria in 2015 and, uh, and aligning with, with the Assad government. Um, and then now this, this extreme, uh, extremely aggressive escalation uh, of the fighting in Ukraine in 2022. Uh, so I think we're going to really, really rethink Putin's presidency. Uh, there's been kind of two narratives. One is that, you know, he's, he's uh, helped Russia develop economically. Has, you know, this is sort of his program to, uh, as he says, raise Russia from her knees. Um, and people have attributed his popularity to living standards. Um, but I think now we'll see whether that's actually true or whether it's really about war uh, and, and, and about uh, this raw power. And so uh, I think we're going we're gonna to really, that's going to be something to watch. The second is this idea of a new Cold War, which has been, been discussed really um, since, since 2014, uh, which I've been skeptical of because I think it, it ignores the role of real ideological differences. And I think that um, rather than representing a really different ideology. Putin's politics, I would place them on the extreme end of a spectrum of populists capitalizing on social divisions, the politics of resentment across the globe. Uh, but there are some echoes of the Cold War here. One is this, this alliance between Russia and China, uh, which, you know, if the Cold War uh, tells us anything, it, it's probably not going to last in the Cold War, even with China isolated diplomatically the Sino-Soviet partnership lasted a, less than a decade. Um, the other thing that's striking, I think even more than in the Cold War, there is a, a really uh, unified Western response for now. Um, there is also, I think, echoes of Afghanistan with, with uh, Russia under-reporting the number of, of its soldiers that are dying, and um, very likely, as, as in Afghanistan, um, covering up and um, hiding the coffins of, of its returning soldiers. Um, there are echoes in terms of the migration we're seeing, um, I, and, and I fear we're only seeing the beginnings of, of a really mass displacement um, from, from Ukraine, and so it will be interesting to see. For now, there is, there is solidarity with, with migrants and with refugees. Um, I, I hope it lasts. 
The third point is this question of, of, of uh, nuclear war, which is, is obviously central to the way we think about the Cold War uh, as a nuclear show, showdown. Um, denuclearization was this idea that really came at the end of the Cold War, and even people like Ronald Reagan were, were, were talking about nonproliferation. Uh, Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan gave up their nuclear weapons in the 1990s, and now it's Russia that has a nuclear arsenal in the neighborhood. Um, it's hard, and I, I say this very, very reluctantly, but it's hard not to wonder how the past year would have played out if Belarus, which is now essentially occupied by Russian troops in, in um, cooperation with its, with its uh, dictator, uh, Kazakhstan, which was a site of a recent Russian intervention, and Ukraine, uh, how this would have played out if these countries had nuclear weapons. Uh, I've, I've talked to some of my colleagues in history, uh, Shada Jahanbani, who works on the Cold War, and you know, sort of, we've been wondering and talking about whether this will lead to further proliferation. I hope not, uh, but I can see how it might. A um, couple more points really quickly. Uh, Putin invokes uh, early modern period, the 19th century, the early 20th century, but I've really been struck about how much the 1990s is really at the fore here uh, and how, you know, if Westerners maybe have an overly rosy view of the 90s, um, this is again something I've talked about with my colleagues, uh, Russia and the Russian government has really worked to cultivate an opposite view, uh, this idea of a wild and unstable Russia in the 90s that, uh, that, that this was, this is, you know, that we, the Russia should move as far away from this period as possible when there were really serious economic problems, but the press was freer, people could protest, and at least one could talk about democratization. Uh, and I think this last point plays into this, this issue of generational change. I think anyone watching Putin and Zelensky uh, back to back really sees uh, very vividly this generational difference. Uh, Putin, who's born in 1952, is, is, is really quintessential Soviet baby boomer. He was born in the war's aftermath. He grew up in a very stable 1960s and 70s when it really seemed like everything was going to kind of, um, you know, this was the way the world was going to be, and then it all fell apart. Uh, and he can kind of imagine now, as someone who's older, that the last 30 years are kind of a blip, uh, and that, you know, this restoration is going to bring back something that everyone really remembers. But 30 years is a long time. Uh, this is an entire generation. Uh, this is longer than the interwar period of independence uh, among the Baltic states uh, between World War I and World War II. Uh, people born after the Soviet Union collapsed now have children. Uh, people fighting right now uh, to defend Ukraine and, and the Russian soldiers being, fight, uh, being sent into, the, into Ukraine to invade uh, have been born actually in the early years of Putin's presidency. Um, Zelensky comes from a very different generation. Uh, he's born in 1978. Uh, so he was only 13 years old when the Soviet Union collapsed. And so I'm not meaning, I don't mean to suggest at all that everything will be better uh, when, when a new generation comes, but I think generational change is really afoot, and this is something that is totally missing uh, from Putin's calculations, and I think missing from the calculations of those who talk about restoring the Soviet Union, uh, because it is, it is not only a distant memory, uh, it's, it's something that simply has, uh, that predates uh, the time that many of these people uh, who are now on the ground uh, have been born. All right, well, that's all for me. Uh, I'll, I'll turn things over now. Thank you. I'll turn things over now. We have two more presenters, uh, Valeri Zutsati from Political Science and Annie Kokobobo from Slavic and Eurasian. Okay, uh, so, uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to speak at this uh, panel. And um, so, a few words about my background. Uh, it's probably important to say, um, to make it like public. So, uh, originally, I come from Russia, and uh, I came over to the US about uh, 15 years ago. Um, and, um, yeah, so. Um, I must say uh, that uh, I have been critic of Putin since 1999, uh, and that was connected to the uh, first, I mean, actually, second uh, Russian-Chechen war that started in, in 1999. And uh, all these pictures that um, you know, we are seeing now in Ukraine, uh, they, you know, 
Uh, they resemble what uh, we observed uh, in Chechnya back in the day, and also in the first uh, Russian-Chechen war in 1994 and uh, 1996. Um, <clears throat> this is not in order to say that, you know, kind of I told you so moment, but just to make clear kind of where, uh, you know, my views are and all kind of stuff like that. Um, in my very brief uh, presentation, I want to speak about, so mostly I will speak about Russia, actually not about Ukraine in this, uh, in this context. So um, I want to say a few words about um, political science and political science theories, how they can help us to understand what is going on in, um, in, um, in Russia and uh, Ukraine in, in relation to this conflict. So. Um, there, is a, uh, there are a number of theories, of course, uh, more or less helpful to understand conflict. So one of them that uh, particularly caught my attention is diversionary war theory. The idea of diversionary war theory is uh, fairly straightforward. When the ruler uh, faces domestic challenges, like his or her unpopularity uh, is high, then uh, he or she launches uh, inter interstate wars in order to boost popularity. And uh, there are two mechanisms behind uh, that boost. So one mechanism is just the rally around flag effect, which happens uh, pretty much in all societies. It's when, during conflict times. And uh, it's not really specific to Russia. It's specific, I mean, it's specific to any society that is in conflict. And the other um, type of, uh, the other mechanism is through um, building the reputation for, um, for competency. So, so, which means basically when the ruler starts a war uh, and the, the war is successful uh, for him or her, um, then um, they can show, they can signal that they are competent to run the country. Uh, so, and in Putin's background, we can see actually both types of, uh, of, of these mechanisms uh, uh, at play. So first, uh, the Russian-Chechen war, uh, when he showed that, you know, using very brutal tactics, it is possible to bring back the secessionist ter territory, um, uh, no matter the human costs. And the second uh, that we have seen during uh, the first Russian uh, uh, during the first Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine in 2014, when Putin's, Putin's popularity skyrocketed and uh, stayed very high for about two three years after uh, the annexation of Crimea, and what we are seeing now, because actually. Uh, you know, despite, um, you know, some media reports, there have been protests in Russia against war, that's true. But many Russians uh, do support Putin. That's, that's also uh, true. Um, we don't know exactly how many, but some estimates uh, say about two-thirds. And uh, they don't sound too unrealistic to me, at this point in time at least, because many Russians are seeing very different picture from what we are seeing uh, on our screens. Um, they are primarily getting their information from the Russian state TV, uh, which uh, you know distorts the information significantly. Um, so the other uh, the other issue, the other uh, theory I was uh, going to mention was democ democratic peace theory, and uh, which essentially means that democracies um, uh, are more peaceful. They they don't. They don't fight each other, they don't fight, and they don't fight other states in general, uh, too. Um, so one of the reasons for why democratic states don't fight uh, other states uh, is that um, they don't, they are very careful to choose targets. And if the war is unwinnable, unwin then um, they don't go uh, to war. Why? Because if uh, the ruler loses war, then the ruler loses also office. And of course, the opposite should also be true in autocracies because the autocrat does not really incur the cost at the electoral boots. Then he or she might, might be more likely to engage uh, in uh, conflict. 
So, and Putin's example uh, is particularly interesting because, you know, it appears it's not simply about being an autocrat, but perhaps being uh, in office for a very long time. Uh, because perhaps, I mean, it's very unlikely that 20 years ago or even like 15 years ago, Putin would have gone for a, um, uh, to, would have gone for an adventure like this, you know, to take on, uh, uh, on a country uh, like Ukraine. And I know, you know, I have to draw your attention that uh, Ukraine is a 40 million, more than uh, 40 million country. It's a very large country. And by, uh, by territory too, it's the, one of the largest or the largest country in Europe. Uh, and notice Russia in its modern history has never taken on a large country like this. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what, what does it tell us about, uh, about uh, the ruler of, uh, of Russia? It means that basically, you know, many social scientists predicted that war would not happen. Even like a month ago or so, they would say, no, it's not possible because it's irrational. It's, you know, it, it won't, it won't, it's not, it's not gonna benefit neither Russia nor Putin. Uh, but miscalculations happen. And the longer the person stays in office, uh, the longer he hears that how great he is and how, you know, how powerful and etc. etc. Imagine yourself spending 20 years and hearing one thing again and again. You are the greatest person in the world, the most magnificent, the most kind of all kinds of, you know, superlatives, right? And nothing negative. I mean, would that, would that not change your psyche? I mean, of course it would. I mean, any normal person would change. Uh, so it's not very difficult to understand uh, what we are seeing. At the same time, I want to say, I don't agree with people who are saying that Putin is irrational or, uh, you know, crazy or, you know, and that's it. He has a fair, fairly large uh, support base in Russia, which is connected to other things that uh, previous speakers have uh, mentioned. And I will probably stop at this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, and before we go to, to questions, our last speaker is uh, Professor Annie Kokobobo. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I'll move this up a little bit. Um, so I'll start, we're all kind of positioning ourselves a bit, so I'll, I'll position myself to um, I'm a Russian studies scholar. Um, so I thought it was important, I even I go last, actually. Um, but um, at the same time, I'm also first generation Albanian immigrant of multi-faith Albanian immigrant. And, and you know, I've seen events, not like we're seeing in Ukraine, um, but similar events growing up. And, and, you know, I think we're all sort of being affected in our places of vulnerability right now. So I just want to put that out there um, for everyone. Um, you know, turning to Russia, um, the first thing I, I want to make clear is that this is Putin's war, um, that this is a war that is being led, engineered by Putin. This is not Russia's war necessarily. Um, and I, I wanna kind of break that down. So there's a couple things I want to focus on. The first thing is disinformation. Disinformation is really important here, um, both kind of leading to the war and now, especially now. And it's really obvious now. But leading up to the war, there's this rhetoric of, we're going to defend, we're going to restore peace in Ukraine, right? This is the rhetoric that's coming from the Kremlin. Um, and even the words war and attack, assault, these, war, these words are not allowed to be used in Russia. Um, it's called, the, the Russian sort of official channels call this a special operation. And, and I read the Russian, a um, couple of Russian news agencies, the official um, channels, and they, they describe what is happening in Ukraine right now as a special operation with surgical precision targeting only military, um, military targets. So, that, you know, and so I've said to a number, you know, to the extent possible, I've, I've done my best to communicate with Russian friends and colleagues and say, they're bombing Kharkiv where there are Russian speakers. There are people you know. They're bombing apartment buildings. Um, but on Russian television, you know, the joke among my Russian friends and colleagues has been, when are they gonna start showing the ballet 
because that's what they used to do during the Soviet Union when there were international crises going. They would just show ballet. Um, so, you know, this disinformation, I think, is something that Putin has kind of been building up to by controlling all the mass media in the country over time and cracking down further and further. Uh, what we saw with Navalny, where he was arrested, is part of that. Um, right now, there are a couple of, there's still a couple of independent news channels, but even those have been put offline. They've gone onto YouTube this week. Echo Moskvi, the Echo of Moscow, and TV Rain. These were two kind of main independent news organizations trying to tell the truth about what's happening. Those, have, those are now gagged. Um, and they go on YouTube. So the YouTube phenomenon is something that we're gonna really start to see take off because I see kids with the camera, with the phone, going on um, St. Petersburg streets, and Moscow streets where there are pro protests, seeing how the police behaves and, and broadcasting that. So we're gonna see a lot of that um, taking off over time as, as the news channels are being shut down completely, all the independent news channels. The other one, the other independent newspaper that still goes on is Novaya Gazeta. Uh, Dmitry Muravyov, who just won the Nobel Peace Prize, was the editor. Um, very early on last week, he made a statement to say, Novaya Gazeta is a stands against war. This war is destroying Russia's future. We need to start an, you know, and then separate follow-up interviews, he said, we need to start an anti-war movement from Russia. This is the only way we end this. This is what we do. And I just clicked today, this week, on their website. And there's a statement that says, the link to the in initial statement has not been removed. And it says, well, the Russian government has requested that we remove this. So that even that initial anti-war statement was removed. Um, and now Novaya Gazeta, which up until this week was saying war and attack, now they say special operation in, their, um, in all of their news coverage. And they do because they're Novaya Gazeta and because they're no friend of the Kremlin. They put an asterisk next to special operation and a footnote at the bottom and they say, we, this is the word that the Russian government uses. Um, so that you can be a skeptical reader if you want to. The other really good outlet is Medusa. They also put news out in Russian and English um, from the ground as best they can. Again, um, these are small news organizations and anytime they take any money from the West, they have to declare that they're a foreign agent. Um, let's talk a little bit about protests. This is another piece of it. There have been protests throughout Russian cities. Over 6,000 people have been arrested. Um, part of the question that I hear in the West that I want to address a little bit has to do with why are there no more protests, right? And, and again, it's a valid question, right? Because we saw other protests, larger protests. There are a number of reasons for this. The first one is, in the last few years, there's just been this ongoing erosion of civil society in Russia. Right? The people who did protest were arrested. Navalny is arrested. Others have been arrested. Um, the people that we are seeing, the amount of people we are seeing is not insignificant because of how eroded civil society is in Russia, because of how dangerous protesting is in Russia. I read an interview by a sociologist um, recently who said, was talking about going to a protest and getting a concussion um, and saying, you know, part of, part of the challenge, and this is how I understand it too, um, is that in Russia, awareness is building up slowly because of how news organizations, because of how, how much disinformation, because there's no mention of any of this, right? Because soldiers are being sent to Ukraine often even not knowing why they're going there. Um, so that, I think, is an important point to just keep. And then, and then the other part of it is, they saw the protests in Belarus. There were millions of people on the street. There were strikes. What was the outcome, right? What happened? I mean, this isn't a participatory government where if you see protesters on the street as a politician, you would take pause and think, oh, the people aren't gonna vote for me again, but Putin will win whether the people vote for him or not, right? So, so 
it's a kind of, it's a, the value of protesting is also questioned. Like I hear from people who are going and protesting, but they know that there's no real outcome. They just do it anyway. Um, and they, you know, can get fines. And also now there's a new law in Russia um, where if you are considered, if you have in any way helped a foreign government, you can get arrested for treason and sentence up to 20 years. Um, just, it was yesterday or the other day, well, we get most of our news from social media. I want to say something about that in a second. But um, there was some, there was a post of some children who had been arrested by the Russian riot police because they had an anti-war sign. Nine-year-olds, children. So, so again, this is part of perpetuating that state of fear, that, that police state, that again, eroding civil society, making it so that people are too frightened. Like people are getting picked up from their apartments before they even go and protest sometimes. Um, so this is kind of all contributes to the fewer protests and the fact that the ones that we are seeing are more significant. There are more arrests happening in Moscow and St. Petersburg than elsewhere. Um, one thing that I also want to mention is public letters. We've seen at least something like 10,000 people sign public letters in condemnation. And, and you know, there's a range of these letters. They're from artists, they're from different professions, anthropologists, historians, doctors, teachers. Um, all kinds of people. There was one that was just translated today by 350 Russian mathematicians who essentially say Russia has become a rogue state. Um, we can't do science. We can't do what we do in a rogue state with no contact to other nations. We work in these fields internationally. We collaborate internationally and, you know, we value our Ukrainian colleagues. And they call, I mean, they say this is a Russian initiated attack. That is the Russian army that has made it impossible, that is attacking these Ukrainian scholars and have made it impossible for them to collaborate with um, their Russian colleagues. Um, I'm not, you know, I, I guess my final point that I want to make is that in Ukraine, there's so much violence, there's so much, any sense of normalcy is gone. In Russia, the way that I understand from what I hear, and again, I get my information piecemeal, right? Through social media channels, through friends who message on Facebook, through WhatsApp, through friends who message their friends, um, WhatsApp calls. It, it's very scattered, very fragmentary. Um, but I think that there is still some sort of need to preserve some sense of normalcy, right? Because there are no, it's not happening there, right? Um, and, and I think this awareness will evolve over time as they start to see the effects of economic sanctions. They're seeing some of that. They have a hard time pulling out cash from banks, hard time getting mortgages. But this is more incrementally building there um, than, you know, in Ukraine where it's, it's there, right? There's no question about it. Um, so I think that, and then of course, you know, to go back to what Valerio was saying, there are people who still support Putin. Um, I heard a couple of interviews of people saying, well, I never use dollars. I don't care what the exchange rate is. Um, there was a guy on YouTube breaking his iPad um, saying, there you go, there's your, there's your American sanctions. You know, I don't care. And it's like, that's probably made in China, but you know, whatever. Um, you do you. But it, it, these kind of responses, right, in the sense that Putin is, they just watch TV and that the this is a very different picture on Russian TV. I, will, I want to close with just, the people that I talk to are academics, they're avidly against this. Um, and I, I want to just close with two quotes um, from people there. And again, these are just piecemeal anecdotes that we're getting. Um, as a literary, this is a colleague um, who is, you know, um, a scholar in Russia right now and who says, as a literary story and as a historian of Russian society, I know what lies ahead. It will take decades for Russia to return to a place of marginal decency as a country. I wake up in the morning and for the first time in my life, I do not want to wake up. Um, and then the second one is another, another colleague. Um, this one kind of closer to my generation um, who says, the mood here is very bad. We're waiting for the rampant repressions and dry crackers. But there are also supporters, of course, those who watch TV. Um, and, you know, it's a kind of, 
indirect way to say that the, the people who just consume the state propaganda on television. Um, so anyway, I mean those, again, we don't know much more. It's, it's really hard to kind of get information right now. Um, but that's all I had. Thank you.